Good morning. Welcome to our regularly scheduled budget committee where we are about to start hearing all of the departmental reports um, in accordance to the mayor's proposed budget. With me today at the dais are council members Lisa Goodman, Jeremy Schrader, and Philippe Cunningham. I'm Lene Palmasano and I chair this committee. We don't have quorum, but really the purpose of this is a full vetting of the mayor's proposed budget. So at the end of these sessions, we typically take a vote to receive and file. If we cannot, um, then we will just hold that until the next budget committee session. So um, not a problem. We're going to start with um, with the police department. We also have fire and the city attorney's office going today. So let's just get started right away. Uh, also, I'll mention Council Member Ellison joined us and invite Chief Arredondo up to um, give his presentation. Welcome. Madam Chair, committee members, good morning. Good to see all of you today. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to present uh, the Minneapolis Police Department's 2020 budget. Thank you. I should also say welcome to all of the other people behind you in this room. Yes. <laughs> there are many of them. And I just will point out that previously, um, in previous administrations of the police department, very, very few people ever came before council. And there is always a large amount of people here in this room. So access is so important. And so is um, seeing your all faces. So thank you for being here. Madam Chair, thank you for acknowledging and I'd like to also recognize our wonderful uh, leadership team that is present uh, with us today. Uh, Assistant Chief Mike Jose, uh, Director uh, Robin McPherson, as well as Deputy Chief Art Knight, Deputy Chief Kathy Waite, also Deputy Chief Eric Fors, Deputy Chief Henry Halverson, we have Commander Travis Galampi here, and uh, PIO Director John Elder, and of course Natasha Hansen. So. Uh, as we begin to start, um, Madam Chair, committee members, uh, I first want to uh, just say that the uh, MPD uh, is a group of professional and dedicated City of Minneapolis employees who consist of both our sworn and civilian team members working in service and on behalf of those who live, work, and visit in our great city. Through trust, accountability, and professional service, the MPD's daily goal is to provide for the public safety of all of our city in partnership with our communities by building procedural justice by giving those we serve and work with respect, voice, building trust, and being in neutral engagements. So with that, right now I will call up uh, Director McPherson to talk about our current service level changes uh, this year and last, and next year. As you do, I will point out to my colleagues that um, we do have speaker management going. I will also look for flags, but initially, if you could make sure your flags are down, unless you do have questions, I'll, um, there we go, thanks. Madam Chair, Council Members, um, I'm gonna make this difficult for Natasha and actually start at the end, okay? So I apologize, Natasha. Um, I wanted to go over just kind of the total current service level instead of going by program by program, and then we'll go back to program. The current service level, the increase from 2019 is $5.6 million over 2018. The drivers for those that increase is a payroll rate increase of approximately 2.8% a benefit increase, those are normal standard wages. The benefit increase of 5.6%, of that's primarily due to increased pension costs, and that alone was $2.2 .2 million for the year. Increase in internal service charges of 6.4%, that was primarily due to the increase in liability costs. And then other was a decrease in one-time costs for Final Four for last from last year, and also a decrease in uh, the co-responder program, which was also a one-time program or one-time funding, offset by the increase in the uh, body camera uh, base for this year. So that the uh, the increases year over year were pretty sim simple. So when you look at the individual programs, the programs there's a couple of changes that have occurred. One I'm going to point out. I'm not going to go through each one, but I'm going to point out that in the community and collaborative engagement there was an error last year in the FTEs. We included some of the FTEs that should have been in the investigations unit. So the actual number would have been closer to the 72 number that it is this year. The other thing that we changed during the year 
and, and this was primarily for administrative ease. Uh, plus, because of the body camera being now pushed out to all the sworn, was the way that we are currently allocating for 2020 on us primarily internal service charges as well as some of our other fees across the entire department is on a per sworn basis. So in the past we had more of a specific identifying or, or trying to make at least a rationale on which department got how much and it was inconsistent. Again, this is easier, especially with the new budget module that we have. So are there any questions about specific you know, again, the units are basically the same from year to year. There have really not been any changes. No, I have not okay. seen any. All right, we'll go into investigations. Madam Chair, committee members, uh, for the MPD's uh, proposed budget for 2020, uh, we'll start off with investigations. And while the general public places an understandable focus on patrol response, uh, investigations is critical and necessary in keeping our city safe and holding those responsible for crimes accountable, while we also build trust with the victims and survivors of crime. Uh, the proposed budget for investigations uh, for 2020, uh, the request is for three investigators, uh, one in the sexual assault unit uh, and two in our domestic assault unit and we're also asking for a continuation of one sexual assault advocate. Uh, we have seen that our advocates are doing incredibly invaluable, competent and compassionate and supportive advocacy on behalf of victims and survivors. Um, the need for investigators also, we want to mention that technology has certainly played a significant role over the past uh, few years in investigations, whether that's uh, having to have investigators look through camera footage, cell phone footage, body-worn camera footage uh, to help aid in their investigations for prosecutions. Um, I will also say that there is research out there that shows the importance of investigations and how that impacts uh, community trust. Uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics study showed back in 2017 that only half or approximately 45% of violent crime is reported. And we want to, as the MPD, we want to provide uh, better services and build trust with uh, our communities. Uh, so that may see an increase in more reports, uh, but that is certainly a measure that we ultimately wanna see. And so that is the um, MPD request 2020 for investigations. A couple of questions. Um, first, Council Member Cunningham and then Mr. Um, sorry, Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chief. Um, I am really grateful to see this included in the budget uh, because, as you said, this really impacts public trust um, if we are able to deliver follow-up calls, be able to be engaged with victims. Um, so I have a couple of questions. The first is, um, how many investigators and advocates are in the Crimes Against Children unit? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Cunningham, I'm gonna just defer to Deputy Chief Eric Forrest just so I can make sure it's accurate. Can, can we say that on the record so that we can, yes. so folks can hear it? Thanks, DC Force. I, I, pardon me. No, um, I'll have to, let me, I'll have to reflect and check, but I believe we have, a, it's either six or seven investigators in crimes against children. I have the, the statistics for uh, domestic and sex crimes handy right now, and I can quickly make a phone call and I'll get back on the record with sure. you on how, that. How how is that in comparison to the investigators for sex crimes and domestic assault? Um, it's slightly less. However, um, the volume of cases coming into the domestic assault unit is by and large the largest yes. um, unit in terms of volume, yep. uh, which is why that is an area of growth and, and one that we definitely see because of trends of increasing cases coming yes. in. Uh, and, and then as the chief uh, indicated, that um, these intimate crimes, these intimate partner crimes um, are generally underreported. And that could be a result of lack of trust and that things are going to get done. Um, if we want to build that trust and establish it, uh, 
the end result may be more cases as well, and we wanna have the capacity to do so. Um, but I will uh, immediately check with something and, and get back with you on that. But we do have uh, um, uh, people from Hennepin County Child Protection that work hand in hand with our Crimes Against Children right. investigators directly in the unit. Uh, thank you so much for that information. Yes. Um, just as somebody who has a long history in youth work, I just think it's really important that we're really supporting kids who are going through seriously traumatic incidents. So um, I'm, I'm grateful to hear that. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, and then domestic violence, as some of us know, is the only is the only form of crime that has been consistently going up year after year after year Correct. across the entire city. So I'm curious about um, what are some of the barriers, um, this is for whoever, um, what are some of the barriers to domestic violence investigations and then the subsequent prosecutions? And do we have advocates within that unit? Because we have a, a request for an additional advocate within uh, sex crimes, but I'm just curious about domestic violence as well. Domestic violence is one of the units that historically we've had one of the, the better models uh, that is one that is kind of is uh, being duplicated within sex crimes currently uh, and that goes with uh, our partnership with the city attorney because of the the misdemeanor level domestic assaults which are a, a very large portion of the cases that come in uh, there are two advocates that uh, for domestic assault that work directly uh, with investigators and with the city attorney as well um, and domestic assault is historically a very difficult problem. Uh, and as you pointed out, um, it kind of is, you, you can see the cycle of violence when children are victims and grow up uh, from being victimized and then unfortunately may become the perpetrator of violence as well, especially within the home. Uh, one of the things that we're, we uh, are working with to, to help some of these barriers is about immediate response and, and the, the city attorney has come up with uh, is, is uh, put together a program the domestic assault response team at DART and that requires our uh, our investigators uh, who are working on overtime as part of this program to partner with an advocate and go out and immediately respond to after hours on, on weekends to these domestic assault reports because I think one of the biggest um, barriers is at the time of the incident, uh, the victim wants help and wants to report it, but because of that connection, by the time, maybe a, if it's over a weekend, by the time a detective can get to that, some there may be some tendency to either want to protect the person because there is a bond there, and, and we want to be able to gather that information and get that cooperation, and more importantly, get them connected to services that could help them break out of that cycle as soon as possible. Great, Great. thank you so much. I appreciate that information. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, and thank you, Chief. Yes. Um, so we got a really good presentation in public safety uh, a few months ago about the sexual assault investigations work and really heard a lot about the role of the civilian advocate um, from the Sexual Violence Center who seems to be getting rave reviews from uh, people who have needed to report crimes as well as from the uh, uh, investigators in that unit. So one of my questions is how did we decide on sort of a division of labor? Um, obviously there's, there's a skill set in terms of intake and in terms of uh, interacting with victims in a compassionate way that really draws out stories and then there's the role uh, of investigators that can only be done by investigators. My question is sort of how did you decide that an additional sworn officer in an investigator role was the right investment rather than more of the civilian advocates who uh, seem to be making an impact in people's experience. Can you talk us through the the way you thought about that? Um, Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember uh, Fletcher, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I will say that prior to having advocates in these uh, important units, um, we were m probably more centered on trying to deal with the case volume and trying to get cases that we felt that we could successfully prosecute. And there was the gap with the, the victim interaction and really supporting and making sure those victims had uh, follow-up services. Uh, I can say that since we've added the advocates, uh, and I will tell you that particularly for um, a sexual assault unit, I think uh, her 
the advocate's first week on the job, I remember getting a call from community members and I called that advocate and she was able to help and walk a victim through a process before the weekend was out. Uh, so I, there's a definite value there, but I'll let uh, Deputy Chief Forrest explain kind of how that racial of where that split comes into play there. So. Um, when it comes to uh, our partnership with the advocate, <clears throat> one of the reasons why additional an additional investigator would be beneficial is uh, that the volume of cases coming in are going up. Um, the, the currently, the number of uh, criminal sexual conduct cases that we're handling year to date is higher than last year and is higher than it has been in the last five years year to date. Um, we're seeing, and the, the chief referenced some of the national crime victimization numbers, and we're seeing um, some steady increase in people being willing to report uh, criminal sexual conduct, because there's the number of cases that we know from NCIC that come in, and we can say these are the number of criminal sexual conduct or rape cases that are being reported, but there's a, there's a lot under the surface that aren't being reported, and, and some of that is because of that barrier of trust. Um, with that volume of cases coming in, um, there's, we want to be able to provide both avenues to people. And for some people, uh, having that connection with the advocate is always a good thing, but having that detective that's gonna be able to also look into the case. Um, the advocate that we have uh, does an excellent job with our partnership in the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, and they help review all the different cases to help either provide their input as an advocate as to what might be the best mechanism, go along with the detective to do interviews or sit along with them in an interview, depending upon what's best for the survivor, uh, and provide their input. Sometimes the criminal justice vehicle isn't the best way to get, or we're just incapable of getting the answer they want, but the advocate can maybe help them in their healing. Um, however, sometimes the answer lies in both, and we definitely wanna be able to have that criminal justice alternative as well. And we want to be able to maintain as um, manageable a level of caseload. Um, sex crimes are one of those units that you're gonna maintain a caseload, and, and a lot of the detectives carry well over 20 cases continuously because they're not just current cases, they're cases that may go back to last year and because of lengthy follow-up or follow-up investigation. So when we see the number of cases increasing coming in, uh, the concern is that the capacity for assignment of cases uh, will not be there or that you'll reach that point where giving any more cases is actually causing the cases that they have to not get as much attention. Thank you, good questions, really good information. Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, um, I wanted to, we currently have two community navigators for domestic violence, right? One, one. We have one. Can you talk more about the role that that community navigator plays when they're and how that fits into the yeah. special this say, domestic yeah. assault unit I, uh, as the navigators work directly for chief of staff Knight, i know he has <laughs> a little bit more detailed nuance to that than i will i'll defer to him great right. thank you deputy chief Knight. welcome good morning uh the community navigators we have approximately uh one for uh african-american community also one uh our Somali community, you speaking specifically for our intimate partner violence. Uh, right now, that navigator goes to the precincts uh, and meet with officers and does follow up cases for all our domestic, uh, for, well, for some domestic violent cases. And also uh, with the training and work with other advocates too going on calls. Do they work with the domestic violence hotspots folks um, in the health department? Like, how, how is that coordinated? I just want to kind of have an understanding of what happens and what resources are deployed for a domestic assault. Case. Well, the domestic part in the hotspot, you're talking about the program that start off in the fourth precinct? Yes. Yes, they do work with, uh, with them closely hand in hand. Great. Thank you. Appreciate yep. it. I'm not seeing other questions, so go ahead. Yep. 
Oh, Madam Chair, committee members, I just also wanted to follow up with a question that Councilmember Cunningham raised regarding some of the um, barriers. And one certainly I'd be remiss to say over the past couple of years, uh, with a lot of uh, conversations and, and uh, concerns in our immigrant undocumented communities, uh, that has been a concern that I've heard from advocacy groups too, specifically that uh, we may be seeing uh, more underreported uh, sexual assaults and domestic assaults. Uh, because of the fear, again, of uh, government and deportations and, and things like that. So that's another reason why it's important to have that advocacy and make sure that we're building bridges of trust. So, yeah. Do you have numbers to report back? Oh, yes. So, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, uh, the next uh, 2020 budget ask of the MPD, I'll have Director McPherson speak about our automated pawn system and workforce director system. Welcome, Ms. McPherson. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council members. Um, the automated pawn system, APS and workforce director activities uh, is currently just, so you know, currently captured in our, our police special revenue fund. Uh, APS and workforce director are intellectual properties that were developed 15 to 20 years ago. And the automated pawn system was created to record transactions of secondhand property sales like pawn shops in response to state statute and city ordinances. At the time, it was the forefront of property theft crime fighting. Uh, every APS customer pays per transaction or pays for a query. Workforce Director was developed through a grant. Again, that's an intellectual property in the same unit. And it was developed through a grant for our time and scheduling system. And uh, the issue, and we do sell those services as well, and that's done by a number of employees who are using the system. So we have other agencies who are on that system, APS, we have pawn shops, we have other agencies as well. The two of them combined, because they, they really haven't been kept up as far as the software is concerned. So the issue that we're facing right now is that the software is becoming unsupported. And we've received estimates on, uh, on rewriting the software and putting it on a different platform. And those estimates are a million to $1.5 million. So unfortunately, we are also losing customers because uh, first of all, we're, we're, we really, IT governance has said we should not be in the business of, of selling software, obviously. Um, but we are losing customers, and so our expenses are going up, our income is coming down. These are not sustainable programs going forward. So what we have proposed to do with both IT governance and with uh, our IT department is start looking for a new software for time and scheduling. And the concern is that because this, the, especially with Workforce Director, is no longer going to be supported, the platforms that they're on, we have a, a risk if something happens. It would be substantially, it would be extremely significantly expensive to fix at that time. So we are proposing that we take that pro, uh, program and accelerate it, even though the city is also looking at some of the HR requirements and software. So in order to do that, we, we feel like, and IT agrees with this, that we probably have about a year and a half time period in which we can do this to, before we really run a major risk of, of breakage. So the, the ask is for us to stop having customers, um, because we want to decrease the liability if something goes on, which would increase our loss. Right now we're at pretty much a break even, but we're starting to see a loss and we'll probably have a loss for this year going forward. So we want to cover that loss. We want to transfer two people into the general fund. Um, these people would still be uh, the ones who are working on time and scheduling within the department. And then we also want to look into a new software package, which we anticipate will be something between two hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars uh, The police department has put forth fifty thousand dollars for the RFP and testing and review process, and we've already started that process with i t so I know this is a fairly complicated from an accounting standpoint, but again, this is we really feel that this is a risk for the department and for the city, and that we want to mitigate as quickly as possible. So are there any questions? I know Micah and Commander Glampy are here too, if you have questions about the program. Uh, 
Nope, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, so for this workforce director system, so we're we're coming up with a new solution here. Aren't there scheduling solutions elsewhere in the city? Are we working with IT? It just this feels like in, maybe we're reinventing the wheel and overcomplicating this. Uh, I, I, Commander Glampy, may need to answer that. But but first of all, the city is actually looking at a new time scheduling system that they're going to be incorporating with the HR pro project. So that is going to change. The problem that IT sees and that we see, and which is the problem we had back when Workforce Director was originally initiated, is that what we need for our scheduling system is vastly different than what the majority of the city needs. Um, and our program will probably be slightly more expensive, so it doesn't make sense to put everybody on a more expensive program if we can have two programs that then can be linked together. So. Okay. Madam Chair, committee members, uh, next, uh, MPD's request for the 2020 budget uh, would include eight neighborhood outreach officers. Uh, I'm a firm believer that relationships are all about proximity and our neighborhood outreach officers are assigned to be guardians of their neighborhoods in our city. Uh, focused on building relationships with residents, business owners, and community organizations to work on collaborative solutions to reducing community harm. And so the proposal is for eight neighborhood outreach officers for 2020. Um, there is a question from Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so for the fourth precinct, it just says North Side Two officers. In the description, it says um, it brings up Broadway and Lindale. I'm curious if that was. Like, so does that mean that right now we're trying to designate two officers to that particular beat, or is it that one will is definitely uh, designated and there's a potential for a flexible, like an additional beat in North Minneapolis? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Cunningham, I, I think when we were looking at uh, some of the needs of the 4th Precinct, certainly that broadway Lindell corridor was one mentioned. I may re defer to uh, Deputy Chief Waite. I know she's had conversations with Inspector Polfus of the 4th Precinct too. You want to add? Good morning. So Broadway and Lindale is definitely the corridor, that specific area where we're seeing the greatest need at this time. There's certainly a lot of businesses in the area too that would really benefit from having that one-on-one -on -one contact with beat officers. So that would be the location that we'd like to designate them to. Um, keeping in mind, it is a very small area, so they would definitely be able to work out from there to both the east and west, north and south. But having them in that business corridor and having them have touch points in the neighborhood uh, surrounding that particular intersection would be extremely valuable. Thank you. Um, I just had um, some challenges with it being with us designating just resources to Broadway. A lot of times when we talk about crime and safety, what we see is that we just don't, well, really beyond even just crime and safety, we don't get resources north of Lowry. Um, and we do have serious challenges like the Penn Avenue hotspot is one of the hottest hotspots in the city and along that corridor we have two business nodes and an elementary school in between. Mm -hmm. We have intense problems at um, Penn and Lowry between um, the setup there uh, where we have folks who have various substance abuse issues, we have gangs who are participating in open air drug market and people doing that on we have a park there cleveland park and also lucy laney elementary school if you go up a few blocks to 35th and penn we have another open air drug market that's happening there um, and problem commercial properties there as well and so i just would really like to advocate for us to consider the allocation of one of those um B officers to the Penn Avenue hotspot from 26th through Dowling Avenue North because we do have very intense problems along that corridor and our kids and their families at Lucy Laney are scared. Mm -hmm. And so 
what we have done is we've set up this really dangerous situation and families and children are the ones who are getting caught in the middle. And so uh, we've been having a lot of gunfire on 35th and Penn. Um, we've been having um, a lot of drug busts on Penn and Lowry. So I just really would like to advocate for the consideration of allocation of those resources north of Lowry as well. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Schrader and then um, Jenkins. Thank you. I just want to get some uh, clarity. It looks like none of these officers will be dedicated south of Lake Street. Uh, Madam Chair uh, and committee, uh, excuse me, Councilmember Schrader. Um, as of right now, that would be the case. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Councilmember Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chief. Um, to Councilmember Schrader's point, I would strongly advocate for officers being um, concentrated south of Lake Street. Um, but I'm just curious to understand what does neighborhood officer outreach officers mean? Are, are these officers in their cars? Are they out on the street? Are they meet you? I know you emphasize building relationships. Will they be out and about talking to business owners, meeting business owners, creating that, that type of relationship, walking. You know, I, I was speaking with um, the third precinct inspector and he was kind of explaining to me that beat officer doesn't necessarily mean walking on the streets anymore. It's a different ball game. So I'm, I'm trying to get clarity on what, what this means. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Vice President Jenkins. So one of the things that we've been hearing from um, many of our community stakeholders over the last year is that um, uh, names are important and what you name uh, things. And so we're trying to shift away from the, the terminology beat officer. Uh, and so neighborhood outreach officers are in fact those officers who um, are assigned to a neighborhood uh, outside of their squad cars, uh, in those neighborhoods, having that proximity with business owners, residents. Uh, and so um, they're building those relationships. They're also hopefully uh, allowing a diffusion of where the 911 response really doesn't have, they're taking care of their neighborhoods as guardians so that there's not a constant call of 911 calls into those, those neighborhoods. So they're having that direct one-on-one -on -one uh, contact and outreach and so uh, that is that is the goal so I think what you may have traditionally referred to as footbeat officers these would be neighborhood outreach officers and they're working with those communities to help build collaborative solutions to some of the problems that they may be facing uh, and I do uh, as uh, Councilmember uh, Schrader and Council Vice President Jenkins as you've just mentioned uh, yes we've heard that there's a need uh, for that south of Lake Street um, uh, oftentimes when we're working with uh, Deputy Chief Waite and her team um, clearly, when we look at East Phillips and some of those issues around there, there's certainly need there, but, but clearly um, the central neighborhood uh, over there in the, uh, we've had some conversations about some of the areas over there as well, so uh, there's certainly a need uh, there, and we'll work with uh, Inspector McGinty to see if how we can best utilize those resources. Yeah. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. So uh, one thing I want to clarify is sort of how this fits within the Federation contract. Um, are these biddable positions? Um, Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Fletcher, so um, these currently would not be biddable positions. Yes. And so the, the idea here is that these would be in the 30 of the 70-30 formula, and that means that a more senior officer couldn't bump somebody, so people will be able to build relationships with the specific officers, similar to what uh, we had with Elliot Wong in Northeast for uh, decades, uh, where, where people are able to really, uh, the people who are assigned to these positions are able to have some stability in it where they can really learn the position and stay in a stable relationship with the community. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Fletcher, you're, you're absolutely right. The, uh, we, we really want uh, these officers who are going to be assigned to these neighborhood outreach teams, um, they really are invested in those, those communities, those neighborhoods, and so they, are, they would not be, at currently, they, were, they would not be biddable uh, positions. Gotcha. And, and so are these uh, four by ten shifts, or are you thinking about a different schedule to um, accommodate community needs? Uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Fletcher, right now typically they're Monday through Friday, eight, eight hour shifts. Eight hour shifts. 
Yes. Okay. And do we have to give up something else that's currently taking up space in the 30? I know we tried to get beat officers for the first precinct uh, in the last draft, and it didn't, and, and we weren't able to find room in the 7030, uh, is what I was told. And so I'm, I'm curious how we're making this work in terms of the contract. Um, not biddable. Madam Chair, Customer Fletcher, and you say give up something, I mean, just for clarification. Um, so we, we can only have 30% yeah. of our citywide force uh, be in non biddable positions, is my understanding. Uh, yeah. And so um, we run up against that cap uh, pretty consistently. And I'm wondering if we're adding eight in this 30% category, how are we managing that? Uh, what are we moving out of uh, a biddable position? Um, Madam Chair, Councilman Fletcher, I'm going to have Assistant Chief Joe kind of speak directly to that. Thank you. Um, I'm Assistant Chief Mike Jost. Thanks for the question, uh, Councilman Fletcher. Um, the 30 70 split is what you're referencing for everyone's that's uh, contract language. And it's something we always come up against when we're doing bidding at uh, uh, actually in a couple of months. And we do have to compare our staffing against the 30 70 split. Um, just to be simple with it, 30% uh, is discretionary, 70% is uh, our 911 uh, response uh, team for 10-hour uh, uh, shifts in the precinct. It's biddable. biddable. Uh, one part of the contract that has never been uh, pushed and never been, uh, the chief has never exercised, but he plans to exercise moving forward, is that in the 30-70 split uh, part of the contract, it also states that the chief of police has the authority to put any uh, any position into the 70 uh, as that he chooses. So moving forward, the chief plans to uh, push that uh, further. It's never been uh, used, but the, that exact language lies in the contract. So as we move into this bidding process, uh, we're working hand in hand with our labor uh, management attorney from the HR to make sure that we have authority to put people into that 70 that uh, fit uh, within the con contractual language and uh, the chief plans to add some to the 70 this year that have been in historically in the 30. So that will help us and, and allow some flexibility with these beat officers. And uh, we do, we have moved uh, many beat officers across the city into the 10 hour shifts and allowed bidding for those, which automatically puts them in the 70. And that's kind of been uh, the philosophy for the last few years. And we kind of intend to go down that path, continue down that path. It's more about personnel management and holding people to expectations and uh, being very clear with your officers what the expectations and that role is. And if you bid it, then hold them to that accountability. And that has worked quite well. So uh, historically, we would hand pick people and say, uh, I like you. And so you're going to do uh, this job because you'll, you'll do a good job in it. And uh, that has kind of left some people without opportunity to try uh, new roles. And what we're finding is the people that will bid a community engagement position want to go do community engagement. And so we shouldn't limit it to just the ones that were handpicked in the past. So I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So is your read of the Federation contract that we can move a position, we can declare a position biddable that people can't bid into? So the because the idea of, a, of, of a neighborhood outreach officer of, of you know, what, what people are looking for is that kind of stability is the ability to build relationships. And the definition of biddable is that someone with more seniority could bid for a position and bump somebody out of it. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how are we how are we defining this? Are we interpreting the contract that we can protect that in some way, or um, are these actually biddable positions that may not have the stability that uh, folks are hoping for in a community beat officer? Uh, it's a it's a compromise both ways. You have to look at. Uh, we will obviously still have positions throughout the city that we will handpick uh, who the beat officers are. Uh, you take the juvenile beat uh, on Hennepin Avenue. Those people have made very close relationships with people, so it would not make sense to have somebody bump them out of that position. They have a skill set that we need there. Uh, there are other beat uh, opportunities or uh, neighborhood officer opportunities that. Um, Officers could come there, be their first year there, and, and pick up the uh, the relationship building. And it's actually good for our personnel across the board to have more than just those few people that have the relationships. Um, when you think about North Minneapolis, uh, officers, uh, Halfstead and, and Warzenek, uh, anywhere I go, everybody mentions them. That's what we want. 
but I'd like to spread some of that skill set to other officers so that any officer that shows up picks up a little bit of that community engagement. Uh, and, you know, historically it's always been, well, that's the, that's those guys job and, and not my job. I just answer calls and that's not the philosophy we want to have with our officers. We want all of our officers to be community engagement officers. And so, you know, moving forward, uh, we may have to play with that 30, 70 roll a little bit and, and have some give and take and say, you know, this historically was a hand picked spot, but we're going to open up for a bid and clearly lay out what the expectations for that job is. And what I found is people aren't going to bid that spot if they don't want to do the job that the, the job expectations have been laid before them. And, and just one more quick clarification, because it sounded like uh, we heard two different answers. You're thinking five days a week. Uh, eight hour shifts or four days a week, 10 hour shifts? Because it sounds like there's some confusion. That again will be a compromise and that's something we have to make as management decision here. Uh, there will be some jobs that go from eights to tens and some jobs that go from 10 to eight. And it, it depends on what, what position we're looking at at the time. Every year at bid, we have to come back to that split and make sure we're in line with the contract every year. And the numbers change every year because depending on how many staff you have, uh, you know, we obviously have the 88 is our authorized strength, but that's not what's bidding. You know, we're bidding somewhere in the 400 range is who's actually bidding. So uh, you have to look at what your personnel numbers are at the time of the bid and make it, it's, it sometimes comes down to tough calls. Maybe an assignment that you'd want to have Monday through Friday, eight hour shift, you have to go, I'm sorry, but it's going to be this year. That one's going to be a, a four day a week, uh, 10 hour shift. And, uh, you know, I, I deal with all the inspectors and now I've thankfully got a buffer between the inspectors with Deputy Chief Waite, but uh, I make those tough calls and, uh, you know, we duke it out a little bit with each other, but, you know, that's a, it, what we have found is it's better for the workforce as a whole if you get everybody engaged in community engagement and don't limit it to that's those guys' <coughs> job. And so uh, I never accept that as an answer of give that to those two officers to go do that. It's, it's everybody's. Councilmember Cunningham, and then Jenkins, and then Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for all of that information. I'm hoping to get some clarification about the difference between neighborhood directed patrols and we, what we're now calling the neighborhood outreach officers. Uh, committee, uh, the Chair, and um, Councilmember Cunningham. So. Neighborhood directed patrols um, can actually be limited in scope. So for example, um, if the second precinct is experiencing um, a pattern of issues of robberies along Central Avenue corridor, uh, the inspector may want to focus some direct patrols uh, through uh, uh, the inspector's allotment of resources, whether they're on the day shift, the mid shift, or the night shift. Uh, so that can be kind of limited in scope. Um, and there's ownership for a limited period of time in that role, and it can spread throughout the uh, spread throughout the precinct. Uh, neighborhood outreach officers, they are committed. If, uh, for example, officers um, have said Warzenek, they have a committed neighborhood that that's theirs. They own it uh, throughout. It doesn't matter if uh, uh, they're experiencing some more uh, layers of challenges and uh, Inspector Pulfus brings in directive patrols to also augment that. But once that goes away for the directive patrols, those two officers as neighborhood outreach officers, that's their, they own that. They're still there. They're still there. Yeah, so um, I, I appreciate that because I wanted to make sure that folks had a clarification about the yeah. difference between the two roles. Um, and just to kind of elaborate a little bit further, I've been um, digging in a little bit because we have been having, we have had for quite some time some challenges in particular parts of the fourth ward um, with knowing that there are open air drug markets that are happening in various spots throughout the community. And um, I just want to share uh, with my colleagues and the public that uh, at one point when it, when this unit, the directed uh, neighborhood directed patrols were fully staffed, I believe that there were eight people in that particular role um, at the fourth precinct, including one of them being a supervisor. But now we have had five people who have gotten promoted, whether it's like moving up or laterally or might be on sick leave or whatever the case may be. And so now we have three for the whole fourth precinct until 
the bidding process in November, but then that won't actually be put into place in until March, if I'm correct. Yeah. So I just want to I just want to make sure that folks understand that like the bidding process also makes it hard for us to allocate resources to be able to deploy to be able to meet the various needs that were the challenges that we're having. So um, because I, I want I, I really strongly support. Um, increasing the amount of neighborhood outreach officers and I'm just seeing that those sort of directed resources that we would like to have deployed or just having challenges because they're so thinly resourced due to the fact that we can't move more folks into those positions until the bidding process. Am I correct on that? M Madam Chair, Councilmember Cunningham, yes, you're right. So we, we have a certain amount of personnel and, and we encourage our folks to go on and get promoted and experience other opportunities within the uh, organization and when they do are successful in that and want other experiences, yes, it can deplete that um, that direct patrol and so we have to wait till we can have enough to su supplant that again. So you're correct. Yes. Yes. Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much and I think mostly I just wanted to make a comment. Um, and word of caution um, about the way um, the geography is so specific about their neighborhood outreach officers. Um, you know, the city's divided up into 13 wards and into precincts and everybody worries about their neighborhood and their place and so people will be wondering, some who really want be, uh, a neighborhood outreach officer, why didn't I get one? I mean, even the way it's presented here, the north side is is large, East Lake Street extends a long way. When you read down into it, you realize, oh, it actually doesn't include the East Lake Street that I know and represent or that my neighborhoods are concerned about. It's somewhere else and um, makes me wonder, let's say things change dramatically um, in the first six months in one of these areas and all of a sudden there's a really dramatic change seven blocks away. Have we committed in our budget now to say, nope, that neighborhood outreach officer is restricted to there or not? Or if we move somebody and the council member and the neighborhood says, why did you remove our neighborhood outreach officer when we had one? So the wisdom, I mean, politically, I think that this could be a smart way to do it and you could look at who's the council member for there. I'm not quite sure how that could, you know, there's strategic reasons why you might want to identify a geographic area, but it's a, it's a, tricky area to wade into. Um, I would suspect from the managerial point of view, um, it would be easier to say we're going to add eight new officers at this level or rank and to do this rough job and then you have discretion about where they end up getting assigned in the course of the next budget year, which is for, I mean, we can respond to this and I'm sure you guys are kind of getting what I'm talking yes. about, how to, what dangerous territory we're in here, but it, I also see how it kind of makes sense. But I think it'll be really important if you have objective criteria, people know what they are, and if there's a protocol and a process for how you would move an officer or assign an officer in this role to an area, everybody should know what that is really clearly. So um, we're not open to thinking there's some kind of a, Shenanigans going on, yeah. Madam Chair, Councilmember Gordon. I know I appreciate your comment. I I should all, and I, I I'm sure you're aware of this. Our neighborhood outreach officers would operate in a space where, um, you know, there's there's no force field that says if issues are occurring just two blocks away from me that we can't get engaged um, with with what's happening two blocks from normally where I'd be assigned. Um, and actually even other precincts. What we have seen sometimes is that on the borders of precincts, third and fifth precincts specifically along the Lake Street corridor, uh, there may be issues that fifth precinct is experiencing that uh, filters into the third precinct and we would expect those neighborhood outreach officers to make contact with the, uh, uh, the, the officers who are working the fifth precinct uh, neighborhood outreach teams and, and, and work collaboratively. And so, uh, so we would also work obviously with our communities who uh, are nearby block club associations, uh, business owners, to make sure, I mean, we, we don't want an officer to uh, uh, turn a blind eye just because, well, it's two blocks out of my, we, we want them to recognize, identify, work in solutions that they see impending problems that could potentially come into those neighborhoods uh, to be flexible, to be adaptable. Uh, I think as uh, Councilmember Cunningham mentioned, uh, we certainly know that there's challenges at times on Broadway Avenue corridor, but we also know Penn Avenue corridor faces those in north of Broadway. And so we'd really want to work with the inspectors, uh, the uh, neighborhood associates 
associations and, uh, and certainly our council members, if, they're, if obviously you're hearing a lot from your uh, constituencies, we want to make sure there's some adaptability and flexibility in that. I'll, I'll let uh, Deputy Chief Woody comment as well. Madam Chair, Council Member Gordon, I have to tell you that you're, you're right in the fact that we, we would never want to just focus in on one area. That would be negligent on our part. And I can tell you, having been a beat officer on West Broadway, I didn't necessarily stay on West Broadway. When incidents were occurring off the block that we were very well aware of, very familiar because of our work on West Broadway, we moved off that West Broadway. We moved up to 21st and certainly up to Lowry to support the other efforts that were happening in those blocks. Working very closely with the Neighborhood Association and Business Association, there's a benefit to that. If we assign an officer to all of East Lake Street, that really waters down our approach to the neighborhood outreach work that we would expect of an officer. And certainly they are going to be flexible and they are going to be able to move around. Uh, from time to time, we certainly see crime patterns evolve and shift. This is why we meet with all of our, uh, our constituents and meet with them monthly to talk about what they're seeing in the neighborhoods too. Uh, it's been helpful to meet every week and talk about the crime patterns that continue to shift and change. When you squeeze the, the balloon, things pop out the other ends, right? And we want to make sure that we're adapting and shifting to that. So I think that neighborhood outreach officer, you know, the, the sense is that you would focus on an area, but we're not immune to the fact that we would be very much interested and willing to move beyond that, beyond those borders, so that we could be effective in serving the community in that area. Thank you, Councilmember Bender, and then Fletcher, and then. Could I just make one one further comment before I lose the floor? Quickly. I appreciate all that. Um, the piece to think about then is what's the criteria? So let's say everybody around 38th and Chicago um, thinks that they need a neighborhood outreach officer. Um, I think we need to be thinking about what. When did when do we make the call? How do we make the decision? When does it make sense? You don't have to answer it now. I don't expect you to have all that criteria and the formula out there. But we're going to have to have an objective kind of way to say, no, you can't have one now. Um, you go and um, lobby the mayor for the next budget or whatever it is. Or we say, um, if it reaches this level or we see these 10 things, um, then we'll, we might be in a position to try to make that decision. I think that's, that's all part of it. Thanks for the extra time. Absolutely. Thank you. Council Member Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think this is a good follow-up. Um, so I guess I first want to say I do agree with Council Member Gordon's points about creating some kind of criteria for sort of a place-based yeah. intervention. And especially because so much of the work of the department is collaborative, I think it's helpful to understand how these particular kinds of officers would fit into other work that's happening in the community or perhaps if we even want to think about that as one of the criteria, like are there additional community supports available outside of just a couple of officers that help address the holistic problems we're seeing in a particular area? Um, and I think that would help us understand how it fits into all of the other budget priorities that are in front of us. Um, my question, though, was understanding how these kinds of specific resource allocations fit into the bigger picture. And when we hear um, a lot of advocacy for more officers, it's often coming from business community representatives who are particularly concerned about bar close in downtown or uptown. And so the council members who represent those areas that have like a lot of traffic and pressure at bar close are contacting the council members who represent those places a lot. And those, you know, that's in the media a lot and referenced a lot in media commentary. Um, and so can you talk about how this kind of approach um, which I think is very thoughtful and helpful and again like has a lot of opportunity to be collaborative fits into that bigger picture of when we have to deploy resources to particular um, sort of larger pressures like bar close. Madam Chair, Council President Bender, thank you for uh, your question. So um, there was actually a time uh, in the MPD when um, our largest footprint uh, was foot or, or traditionally called footbeat officers or neighborhood outreach officers. Uh, there's probably stories from many of you who probably in your neighborhoods growing up 
or even hearing your parents say, we remember our neighborhood officer by name. Uh, they'd be at the schools and the parks and what have you. Uh, as as uh, cities have grown and as police departments have become more uh, certainly mobilized to take on the volume of calls, uh, we've become in many ways just so reactionary and responsive through 911. And we have, uh, and what's uh, no, certainly uh, in, in terms of efficiency and responding faster, uh, there are claims that we probably do that better today than we did 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, but the problem that we are experiencing is that um, through that time and through that transition, uh, it has not done us well in terms of that community trust. And we need to make sure that from both a trust building standpoint and the relationship piece, that we have officers like the Hafsteads and the Wars and X uh, and the Sergeant White who's doing a fun phenomenal work with her teams and direct patrol on the north side. We need people to connect with us in those ways. Uh, it also brings us closer to the challenges and situations out there that are occurring and we're able to have people who can tell us real time what's occurring. Um, uh, but also, if done right, um, that should help lessen call loads in certain neighborhoods, if those officers are really committed and invested in with those business owners, communities, residents, the schools in the areas, uh, we can collaboratively help to try to solve those problems uh, before they become bigger problems. And so that's that's the goal of it. Uh, and we've even obviously heard that from all communities throughout the entire city, is that um, while we appreciate and we certainly want, um, I mean, even if you think of our, our model of measurement is um, how fast we respond to a call. But we don't have a measurement of were the folks satisfied once we got there? Was that relationship there? And so, as Assistant Chief Joe's mentioned, we don't want it just to be relied upon just the half-sit and wars in it. We eventually want that to be the, the mindset as we try to transform the MPD throughout the department. And so that's where we see the biggest dividends pay off. Uh, I was a neighborhood outreach officer many years ago along the Golden Valley Road, Penn Avenue corridor, and it was my responsibility to make sure that I was in tune working with our communities so that the nine, that it did not become just a 9-1 response, that I was actually actively involved in working with our community to help resolve those issues. Maybe just a follow-up comment. Um, you know, having been here a little while, not too long, I would observe that the police department isn't the only department in the city that we are trying to change in terms of culture and priorities, process, that's happening throughout the city enterprise. And there's always kind of a question that was referenced earlier, which is, do we ask everyone in the department or everyone with a particular skill set, like transportation engineer or police officer or housing inspector to rethink their job? you know, kind of holistically all at once, or do we hire specialized staff to do a particular thing that is a change from business as usual? And in the past, I have seen good success with hiring particular staff to identify, you know, to, to fill a role that is about changing culture or changing how we do things. And I do think it works to do that and then see the change sort of permeate throughout the culture of an organization. I think that is an effective strategy for system change within a city department. Um, but I do want to name that kind of balance, which is, you know, are we, which was again was referenced by the department. Do we ask, you know, how are we transitioning then to sort of the assumption that everyone is really doing this kind of work? And it's coming later in the presentation, but I think about that a lot with our homeless outreach having Sergeant Snyder doing an enormous amount of work in my ward, both along the Greenway and in uptown storefronts where people are living because our homelessness crisis is reaching a point where um, folks are really living outside in our parks and our trails and our storefronts and our doorways. And Sergeant Snyder alone, working alone, has built enormous trust within the community of folks who are experiencing homelessness, has been able to do outreach in the business community and I think build more support from folks who are asking questions like why are there people sleeping on the sidewalk and turning it into a conversation about homelessness and the support that we need to bring as a community to address that issue. But he's only one person. And so I'm excited to see that work expanding. Um, but I think it kind of asks the question, you know, how much can we really expect one person or two people to do? And how is it fitting into the bigger picture of making sure that function is really effective across the city? Specifically to your uh, specifically to your point, um, I'm happy to actually call him Lieutenant Snyder now, which is promoted, but it goes back to what uh, um, we were saying about 
we're going to have officers uh, and employees who get promoted and who move on to different assignments. And so we are actually trying to, as we try to transform the department, as you had mentioned, Council President Bender, and we see that across all sectors of the city enterprise, um, we will now have someone else coming in, and uh, Lieutenant Snyder uh, uh, really passing along that knowledge history, helping to build those relationships as well, uh, because we want this to be uh, sustainable and long-lasting long after those current people are in their roles. And so that's how we want to truly try to help in changing the culture of the MPD. Thank you. I'll point out, I think we have seven more change items to go. We do still have a number of people in queue, and this is an important conversation to have. It seems we're interested in having it now, which is great. Um, originally on the schedule, MPD was here until 11, and then we had 30 minutes for the, each of the next two departments. So I just want to point that out to my colleagues, but I'm getting the sense that there's energy around this conversation, so let's keep having it. Council Member Fletcher, and then Goodman, and then Morisami. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, so I want to ask a little bit about our staffing levels in general, because I think part of the frustrating thing sometimes about talking about staffing levels is the massive fluctuation that happens over the course of the year as we, we have an academy class, we have a recruit class, um, and uh, this, when we authorize a sworn force, it's 888, and then we end up being, you know, above it or below it at various times, and we were down quite a bit in August um, by more than the 14 sworn that are, you know, proposed to be added here. And so I guess, you know, one of my questions is how confident can we, can we be that these officers will actually be assigned to this role? Given that in a lot of cases, I mean, if you have a shift where you've got a couple of neighborhood outreach officers, but then you also have two people on parental leave and somebody goes out on medical leave you weren't expecting and three people retire and suddenly you're trying to figure out how do we, uh, you know, kind of infill these roles. I mean, we're hearing about, you know, five directed neighborhood patrols that aren't filled right now and that aren't going to be filled until March. And so it's great to add two neighborhood outreach officers, but that doesn't even get us to whole on some of the staffing holes that have been created by this fluctuation and by, um, you know, we count the uh, people in recruit school as part of our total towards the 888, so we're often way down during the, while the recruit school is operating. Um, and so I guess my question is, what's the commitment to these neighborhood outreach officers being neighborhood outreach officers? Uh, either when the rest of their shift is really short um, in their precinct or uh, when this role ends up with attrition from promotion or retirement or whatever uh, and we're competing in the draft to infill you know all kinds of roles all over the uh, uh, patrol universe how how confident can we be um, that these positions that we're authorizing are going to be used as these positions uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Fletcher, you would have to ask that question, wouldn't you? <laughs> okay. I, and I say that. I, I say that just to say that um, there are no absolutes. I will tell you that um, we cannot fill these roles that we're talking about until we have people that can come in. Because once we, we move them, if we were to hypothetically have these eight ready to be named tomorrow, we would have to, they're coming from somewhere, and so we'd have to, uh, and typically we would wait till after those folks are done with their uh, training at the academy and actually uh, placed on a shift. And so, um, so yeah, they, we would not have eight bodies falling from the sky to just put right in those roles. Um, matters such as you mentioned, FMLA leave and all of these things, they certainly all, all factor into that. Um, and so we, we certainly want to have a, 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 a projection of what we would like to see in terms of that. Um, but there, it's, it's constant. I know that uh, uh, Assistant Chief Jose has been working on, I'm sure he may have shared with you, kind of that, that uh, arcing. And we, it just, uh, and this is, by the way, this is, predates all of us. This, that's just the way that we've always typically tended to, to look at our staffing needs. And so I think there's been some great conversation that has come forward about this, uh, because you're right. It doesn't, um, uh, we, we, we know that there are no absolutes, no guarantees but we should be trying to get at least close. And so I'm hopeful that these conversations that we have with all of our elected officials regarding this, because you bring up a very good point, and particularly when you talk about how we've been, account, how we've been counting folks in our academies into these numbers. And so I know that uh, through uh, Director McPherson, Assistant Chief Joseph, there's been a lot of conversation about that. Uh, I would feel more comfortable if we could come to more clarity about what numbers are we actually counting 
I would be a lot more, uh, uh, probably perhaps more confidence in, in these numbers. And if we placed eight here, that we knew we had bodies to immediately supplant them. Um, we're not there today. Uh, but I think it's an absolute important conversation to have. Yes. I, I would also feel a lot more comfortable uh, in, uh, in, in thinking about funding positions like this if we felt confident that we knew they could be used that way. And, I'll, and I'm asking this in the context of knowing that neighborhood outreach officers is the thing that people um, feel like will be the most impactful and certainly the thing that I feel like would be the most impactful. I'm supportive of that and I actually think there's a conversation we should be having about whether uh, the money that we spend, that we make individual bar owners spend on off-duty officers to stand in front of their bar would be better spent funding, collectively funding more FTEs um, to have neighborhood outreach officers uh, specific to downtown. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that's a conversation we should be having in the long run. Um, but we have to, we would have to know that we could actually get those resources dedicated um, if we were going to make a move like that. And so I think there's there's opportunities to think about how to invest in the department in a way that smooths out that curve. Yeah. And I almost feel like we have to do that before we just talk about adding on to uh, this thing that, as you say, pre, you know, long predates both of us. It's been the status quo for forever, and we have an opportunity maybe to think about fixing it. So let's do that together. And um, Madam Chair, Customer Fletcher, so I appreciate I appreciate your, your conversation, your voice on that. Uh, and I will say the guarantee is if we are uh, saying eight officers or neighborhood hours, they would be eventually placed in those. Uh, it's just this conversation we talked about that, that tends to fluctuate. And so I absolutely look forward to having more conversations with you on that. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I uh, have great respect for everything everyone has said. I will say, however, the fact that we have fluctuation as it pertains to recruit classes is more proof to me that we need more officers, and a lot more than 14, in my opinion. We don't ask other department heads, are you really telling us the truth? Can you imagine if Robin Hutchinson was sitting up there and she said, we're going to pave this number of miles, and our reaction was to her, are you really going to pave that number of miles? We're not sure if you're going to pave that number of miles. So I'm just kind of wondering why we're treating this department head with a level of question when he's done nothing other than basically move to transform the department in a way that we're all asking for. And at some point, we have to, I think, believe him. And I, I would urge us to get to the point of believing him rather than just asking him whether or not we're confident he's going to do what we say he's going to do. It feels a little awkward to me. I will say Sergeant Schneider has been doing a lot of work in my ward, Lieutenant Schneider, and he's training other people to do that work. I've seen it in the Loring Park neighborhood, and I've seen it in parts of Uptown. I'm sure Council President Bender has as well. He doesn't go by himself anymore uh, because he is trying to train in other people, and I have great respect for that. If this was, uh, if this neighborhood outreach officers was uh, directed in relation to how much we supported the police, I'd be getting a lot more. Because I'll note half of my ward is in the 5th Precinct. There's been a massive uptick in problems, as Council President Bender will tell you, in the 5th Precinct, including homeless encampments, as well as robberies and all sorts of other issues, and no beat cops are suggested in the 5th Precinct. So I don't know that this is really about how much you support the police and where the beat cops are going as much as it is where they believe the need is. Now, I do think that we have a role to play in saying what I would say, which is I don't think we need any more people on Hennepin and First. I think the beat cops should be in Loring Park because we had a beat in Loring Park for two years and it was tremendously successful. And so I think like others, uh, collaborating with, the, with all council members, uh, Council Member Fletcher and I together perhaps, uh, to determine where these beat officers should go and I think they should go into the Loring Park neighborhood, I'll say that one more time, um, should be helpful. So I just want Council Member Gordon to know through the chair that I don't think this is organized based on how much you support the police because if it was, I'd be getting a whole lot more. And uh, I think I should have a whole lot more because I think we need more cops. We need more than 14. Because if we're having this constant rotation of people in training, we're then 25 to 40 down when we start at the beginning of the year, and I think that's a problem. Um, so I just want to say I think everyone has, everyone on the council has their own experiences in dealing with the community and police in their wards, and I respect that. Um, from where I sit, representing part of downtown and a big portion of the city that's seeing increases in crime, um, I think these neighborhood outreach officers are a drop in the bucket 
compared to what is needed at this point in time. I, I'm going to be um, communicating further about this, but I will tell you that when I first started on the City Council in 1998, there were about 50,000 less people in the city and more officers. That's something to think about. A lot more officers, a lot less people. Here we are 20 years later, a lot more people, a lot less officers, and quite frankly, a lot more crime. So I think we need to think about that. Overall, I'm willing to you know, make a compromise from 50 to 14, but I think 14 is probably not enough. And anyone who wants to work with me to figure out other things that we can change in the mayor's budget to add to 14, to add more neighborhood outreach officers, I'm there for it. I think I can probably find some things suggested in the budget that we could move from other areas into hiring 24 neighborhood outreach officers so all of the parts of the city that think that this would make some sense have an opportunity to have a neighborhood outreach officer. Thank you, Councilmember Warsami, and then Ellison, and then Bender. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank the chief and the department and for their hard work. And I trust the chief. You know, I, I would echo what council member Goodman said. I've known uh, Randall since I've been on the council, uh, yeah. and I trust his judgment. And I'm very supportive of the neighborhood outreach offices. And the reason why I say that is because we're getting, unlike council member Goodman, I'm getting two beat <laughs> offices in my ward, precinct one, Cedar Riverside, one officer, and Chicago or Franklin. And the reason I'm supportive, and when I see that, that what the Thank you. Yeah. That's a bonus as well. Um, what I see here is the fact is in Cedar Riverside and Chicago and Franklin, you know, Chicago and Franklin has always been a very difficult spot in, in our ward. And it has over the last couple of years, you know, it has been, you know, it has been a flow in terms of crime. And the last 12 months has been very, very difficult. We've had shootings, we've had homicides. We've had, you know, open uh, drug trafficking. We've had, you know, brazen uh, behavior there. People are afraid, the local businesses are afraid. So to have an extra beat officer is a welcome. We need more, but to have an extra one, and for that area to be identified is important. See the Riverside also, we're having a lot of issues with young people, car jackings, uh, you know, a lot of behavioral issues that, that the neighborhood has been facing. We've got, for the first time in a couple of years, we've had two Somali-speaking officers, and they've had a huge impact in terms of confidence and change in perception. Again, having an extra beat officer there is welcome. Um, the one thing I want to talk about is everybody here, you know, I think most of my colleagues here support public safety, and they have different ideas and how to use the resources of taxpayers' money. Uh, but the one thing that I can testify to is every single neighborhood that I represent has had an increase in perception of crime. Mm. People are more afraid, even neighborhoods that you would have, you know, in election times, people would stand up and say, you know, we don't want police officers, we don't want this. They've been having gatherings and, you know, there's livability issues have increased, the problems have increased, you know, homes have been broken into. People are unsafe to walk around, especially in Seward, Ventura Village, you know, Phillips West. I've had an, uh, uh, an African-American woman who testified in front of me in, in Phillips West who said, I, somebody broke into my house. I could see the person. I called the police while I'm, I'm screaming and I could see the person and it took them 50 minutes to come. Because of her screaming and shouting, the, the individual ran away, but God forbid, if that person came through the door. And those kind of, I mean, she's not pro-police, she's not anti-police, she just wants to live in a safe environment. And that's what I see all the time. I've never seen people call me and say, we have too much public safety council member. People call every day and they are worried, they're worried for their children, they're worried for their environment, and it's very difficult to live in, in Ward 6 right now. And, and every single council member here should remember that Tent City was in Ward 6. We had a lot of people, a lot of homeless people. We sheltered the whole city's homeless encampment in our backyard. And people were afraid, and that hasn't gone away. Yes, the navigation center had an impact. Yes, we moved on, but still, if you go to Cedar and Franklin, you will see the same you know, number of people standing around, you know, helpless, and our homeowners and our residents are afraid. 
So I do support, like Council, Goodman, Council Member Goodman said, I do support the 14 police officers. And I think we need more, and I think we need to be real about what's happening in our city as well. And to actually walk down the street and see what's happening in our city. And as somebody who lives in Ward 6, I see that the perception of, 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 of violence has increased, the fear has increased, and people are afraid. And I think we need to support our police department. Thank you. Councilmember Ellison. <clears throat> uh, we've also seen the number of homeless increase statewide, and I think that that's, you know, I don't know that we can police ourselves out of that situation. I'm not flatly against this strategy, but it, there were a few things that came to mind as as we were uh, as we we're up here listening to this presentation, um, which is uh, one of the one of the concerns that I have. Kind of echoes Councilmember Cunningham's. Uh, I know typically council members might be up here advocating, uh, you know, that they get more of these beat officers or, or whatever. Uh, but I also uh, know that in uh, in the corridor that we're talking about with Broadway uh, and Lindale, there are some issues that, that neighbors want to see resolved, right? Uh, uh, but I worry that um, we've got, uh, there's one business I can think of that's been very responsive to business licensing and MPD mm -hmm. that sort of cleaned up its act. And, and we've seen uh, uh, safety in that, uh, uh, and that business increase, right? Just by them taking some initiative and responding well to the neighborhood and to uh, what we're asking them to do. Uh, and then we've seen another business in that same corridor uh, that has been a lot less responsive mm -hmm. uh, and, that this, and that the safety concerns uh, coming out of their business uh, have not been addressed, uh, have maybe even been exacerbated. Uh, and one thing I don't want us to do is to, is to be subsidizing businesses who should be taking care of their own safety needs and should be helping the city and responding to neighbors. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, we've got taxpayers paying uh, for uh, uh, basically private security for an individual business along the corridor, uh, a business that's not very responsive, a business that doesn't seem uh, all that concerned with, um, may, which may cry foul, but doesn't ultimately seem all that concerned with uh, the, the safety issues happening along the corridor. And so um, and so to that end, you know, I. I I guess my question would be, how are we going to ensure that uh, we're not um, uh, uh, encouraging businesses to put all that risk and all that burden onto uh, officers who may be trying to um, uh, alleviate uh, some of the issues that are happening in those very corridors? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Ellison, thank you for that, uh, that question, uh, because that is real. And I, I will tell you that uh, as chief, the one thing that will irk me more than anything else, too, is uh, if we have businesses that are hiring off-duty Minneapolis police officers, but yet uh, causing harm to their communities, um, I uh, will work with uh, regulatory services licensing and those precinct inspectors to do all that I can. Um, to They need to be held accountable. Uh, and you do not get a pass by having someone wearing this MPD uniform while you are operating a business uh, that is in not compliant with our city licensing codes and requirements and causing harm to our uh, to our uh, communities. And so uh, when we have problematic businesses like that, uh, our teams are meeting uh, every week uh, working with uh, uh, Deputy Chief Waite, uh, the inspectors there, regulatory services, our licensing folks. We need to hold those folks accountable. But I'm very reluctant, and I know we're going to, there's a large conversation we're going to be having on uh, in an audit actually committee on our, our off-duty work for officers but businesses play a key role in that as well and and they have to make sure that they're upholding uh, the standards that our city would want uh, they have to be operating within those guidelines and uh, I do not want someone wearing this uniform to be perceived as giving them a pass while it's causing harm to their neighborhoods and community I want to point out that um, just yesterday we received and made public the off-duty work audit that um, it really, I think, um, with the support of the police department, starts to dive into how we take an, a different type of look at the quantities and where the, that off-duty work gets placed around our city. And that's a really good discussion. I'm happy to brief any of my colleagues online about that. Um, I, I think the, the kind of one fundamental agreement that I have had in conversations with MPD leadership with even the Federation is that we want businesses to we want businesses to be safe the requirement mm -hmm. should be that they are running a safe operation not that they are required to have two off-duty officers mm -hmm. as a condition of their business license now that in the past is a way that we've tried to get to safe yeah. um, but we want to 
take another look at that and see how we could do things a little bit differently. Um, I'm going to give the last word to Council President Bender, and then we're going to move on because we do technically only have eight more minutes allocated for police. Um, though we, w I'm working with Fire and the county, the city attorney's office to um, see if they could trim or want to move to another day for their presentations. Council President, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I, I really want to highlight um, and thank my colleagues who serve on the Public Safety Committee for really the really depth and thoughtfulness of the questions that we're hearing. And I think we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg of the work that council members are doing to really dig into how the department is working today and how we can all work together to make it work even better for all of our constituents in the future. Um, I wanted to address a couple of things that were stated because I think we actually just had a really thoughtful and important discussion about these kinds of details. But, and I don't want to derail that, but I do want to say a couple things. One is that I, I feel that it is my job as a city council member, and I think there's lots of evidence that the council holds all of our departments to a high standard. Before we invested $400 million in the public works departments for streets, we passed a complete streets policy that directed the department to completely rethink how they re reconstruct our streets. We didn't just hand them $400 million to do business as usual. We required them to change their practices and rethink how they were rebuilding our community in line with our values. And I think that is the same perspective that I bring to the conversation about police investments. The budget of our police department is $180 million. Since I took office, we've added the annual budget today is $35 million more than it was when I took office. So any sort of assertion that the council isn't supporting investments in our police department, you know, I think needs to reflect the reality that we've made a, millions and millions of dollars of investment that includes things like pensions, that includes investments like body cameras that I think were important, that folks, you know, not maybe, maybe not everyone agrees we should have done those things or prioritized those things, but when you compare the amount of money that we're spending on policing to other community priorities, the other community priorities often pale in comparison to the dollar figure that we've given to the police department. And I think we are just starting our budget um, presentations now. We are going to hear from our health department that's seeking to stop lead poisoning for children. We're going to hear from our fire department. Um, that is working to save lives. We're going to hear from our building inspectors that are trying to keep children for, for you know, living in safe communities and safe homes. And I think that is the context that it is literally our job to consider when we're looking at any department's budget. So I think when we ask questions of the police department, we're putting them on the same footing as every other department. Um, and we shouldn't editorialize against our, you know, doing our jobs. And I really appreciate the chief and all of the de department leaders for coming today to, to thoughtfully answer our questions and to have a really great conversation that demonstrates, I think, the department's commitment to the same goals and values. Thank you. I'm going to ask our chief to go ahead and move on because there are other change items that we want to get through. Uh, the next uh, uh, committee chair, uh, council members, the next uh, change item for the Minneapolis Police Department focuses on our co-responder program. And while we recognize the increasing number of our community members living with mental illness or in need of services and treatment, uh, our co-responder is a way to address that. So when people struggle in this area, oftentimes the MPD are called to respond and sadly for too many years, uh, the jail or the hospital were the only two options officers had uh, to try to resolve the situation. Uh, however, we are, fortunately, we are fortunate today that through our co-responder program, we have an officer and a county mental health professional providing effective and compassionate crisis intervention and follow-up with the goal of keeping our community members in their homes with the dignity and respect they deserve. I also um, want to uh, give thanks to Deputy Chief Waite, who has really led this from its uh, uh, creation and beginning, and thank you for your leadership, uh, Deputy Chief Waite. Um, uh, this here uh, ask is um, uh, to continue the funding uh, for the one-time funding to the continue this invaluable program for the um, um, county co-responder program that we're working with them with. Um, the next change item is to increase the records information unit by one FTA E, which will allow for quicker turnaround time for all requesters. Uh, the expansion will also enhance community trust and improve uh, department transparency. Um, over the past several years, uh, we have seen an enormous amount of our uh, records requests. Um, from 2013, for example, there were 66,000 uh, 
uh, records information data requests. Uh, 2018, that number has uh, surged to over 200,000. Uh, the records unit staffing is the same as it was back in 2008, and we also see this as a way to help uh, and building that trust when people are making these requests and do not get them in a timely manner. And I know this has been a conversation uh, you as elected officials have, have uh, heard from your constituents as well. And so the change request for uh, next year's budget is to add one FTE for our RAU unit. Um, we are also asking uh, for a civilian, um, the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, or NIBIN, uh, is a key tool that helps uh, us participate in the federal program which allows our crime lab access to equipment uh, to their national database. And uh, this tool is, uh, is an intelligence tool that helps identifies and links shooting events by matching discharged cartridge casings. Uh, but in order for us to retain this axon to NIBIN, access to NIBIN, the program requires that that information be inputted within 48 hours. Uh, in 2018, we had 410 linked cases uh, through using NIBIN out of a total of 1,200. And in the past two years, through our NIBIN work, we've been able to uh, successfully recover 54 firearms and have linked 132 shootings uh, that were linked to one specific gang using NIBIN. Uh, gun violence in our city is investigated by multiple units within the MPD, but all of them rely upon the NIBIN linkages to help uh, gain actionable intelligence. And so this is a critical piece in helping us to reduce and try to solve some of the gun violence that we see in our city and hold folks accountable. Um, as we have mentioned uh, earlier, we are looking at, and we talked about in all of our, um, uh, throughout our city, we've experienced a surge in, in homelessness and those persons experiencing homelessness. We're looking at adding one uh, additional community navigator. Um, the position would align itself uh, with the Minneapolis 2040 plan uh, to improve community relations uh, by allowing them to further enhance uh, community outreach, offer victim services, and expand communication and, and building trust. Um, we, are, we have seen that uh, more of our persons of color, uh, LGBT youth, um, uh, experiencing homelessness and through the work that we also have uh, uh, Lieutenant Grant Snyder doing, this person would be key in helping us to try to bridge the gap, work with community services and uh, make an impact positively for those experiencing homelessness in our city. If I could pause you there, Councilmember Cunningham. Uh, thank you. And Chief, for specifically around this, um, can you please tell us what communities um, are currently represented in the Community Navigators program? Um, Madam Chair, Councilmember uh, Cunningham, African American, our Native American, um, LGBTQ+, uh, Latinx, East African. East African Somali and intimate partner violence. Great. Um, so I, I definitely recognize the need for um, additional connections around um, homelessness. I also just want to advocate and bring to folks' attention that a community that wasn't named is the Hmong Southeast Asian community. Um, and they have written a letter requesting for city council they've they've asked multiple times for us to take into consideration helping to make that connection between mpd and the Hmong um, southeast asian community um, this is a community that has been um has experienced tremendous uh, tremendous trauma at the hands of previous the previous governments that that they um that they lived under and so there's a huge apprehension and distrust um, and so this is something that they have asked me um, I have a large Hmong Southeast Asian popula population represented in my ward and so um, as their representative I just want to make sure that I name in this space that we've named pretty much at least to my mind all major ethnic groups represented in the community and marginalized groups with the exception of Hmong Southeast Asian. Madam Chair, Councilmember um, Cunningham, you, you're absolutely right. I've also heard from our um, large Southeast Asian um, community leaders who've also expressed an interest in this position uh, as well. I will say that um, 
Uh, last year we had conversations of, about that need and so uh, I will certainly speak with uh, Deputy Chief Knight and others and perhaps yourself as well and, and talk further as we go down this course for the budget. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Members, um, the next year's budget also seeks to um, restart uh, the Minneapolis Police Department traffic unit. Uh, some of you may be aware that that unit had resolved back in 2013. Uh, this would help the MPD respond and address to traffic enforcement equity through our citywide deployment of uh, whether it's traffic complaints, uh, also in response to the ongoing construction issues that many of you have uh, experienced and how that has put an imprint in your local neighborhoods and streets. Uh, we've also seen uh, obviously pedestrian, bicycle safety, we've seen more accidents as it relates to that. This would also be in line and work cooperatively with our city's Vision Zero uh, to eliminate and reduce uh, traffic fatality deaths and injuries uh, with our pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, this would look for three FTEs to help augment uh, citywide traffic enforcement. Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have two questions in particular, um, but before that, I just want to say that road safety in War 4 is a nightmare. It's really bad. Folks are speeding. There is no regard for life when, it, when there are some people who are behind the wheel. Um, the way that I see it is that if we are enforcing cars that are parked, we should be enforcing cars that are driving super fast through red lights. Um, I would say that within the fatal crashes that that's disproportionately represented in Ward 4. Um, and we, I mean, I would say probably every week we have at least one serious car accident that's happening, not only through the major thoroughfares, but also on the neighborhood roads. So you know, looking at like 36th and Morgan, you know, like we have pretty very, very serious car accidents um, and fatalities. Um, so I very much so strongly support reestablishing this um, this division. The uh, there there are a couple things that I'm curious about. What was the previous staffing level when this division was dissolved? Uh, Madam Chair, um, Councilmember Cunningham, um, they had at least a, did they have a lieutenant as well as sergeants and uh, I'll I'll estimate, but it has gone through a couple of renditions. The unit went up and it went down, and it's gone back and forth. Uh, it's had two shifts. It's had one shift. It's had. Uh, you know, days and nights, and it's had supervisors on both. It's uh, gone through a lot of renditions. Um, there was a period back in the uh, mid 2000s where there was a thought process that by adding to the traffic unit, we could actually reduce our budget by uh, writing massive citations, and and the revenue would return and pay for officers. So additional 10 officers were added there at one point. Uh, and then that turned out to not be the case, uh, you know, citation, and plus that was a real barrier um, between us and the community to just go out and write citations. And the, the, the goal of a traffic unit is to prevent accidents and to reduce the danger to the public uh, and not to be a revenue new builder. So that was, uh, I think that was a failed uh, experiment. But the unit did expand to over 20 officers at that time. And that was back in, again, the mid 2000s. So then at some point it was reduced to around 10 officers. And then um, uh, the previous administration uh, uh, really wanted to head down the path of community engagement. And the traffic was, dis the unit was dissolved as uh, completely down to just simply handling accident investigations. Yeah. And each of the precincts kind of picked up with one or two officers that do traffic enforcement. But that's a, you know, they're usually assigned to one shift. So if you're assigned to days, then nights suffers. If you're assigned to nights, then days suffers. Uh, so we would like to head back down the path of uh, putting uh, officers fully dedicated to traffic enforcement because they kind of wrap their head around that and that becomes their specialty. Um, and we can fit them within the 70 of our, our, our bid process by making it a bid position. So uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. And so we need to head back down that path. But uh, you know, this would be a beginning. 
uh, yes, I think we're asking for three additional full-time employees, but we would end up adding more than that out of our current staffing uh, to make it a, a doable unit that uh, you can't run a unit with three people. Right. Uh, you know, we would probably have to get it at least back to so, at some point up to 10 officers so you could have a day and a night shift and all five precincts could have uh, benefit from it. Great, thank you. Um, Follow-up question is, um, three is not a lot, um, so how do we imagine those resources being deployed, um, and also where would it live? Like, would they, would one of the three be a supervisor, or would that be under the current existing traffic investigations? How, and then with the three, would they be concentrated in areas that have challenges with road safety or will it be like the three precincts that have them like how, how will these resources actually be deployed uh, madam chair council member uh, cunningham uh, i i see them currently working in collaboration with the current uh, investigative accident investigations teams uh, i would rely upon dc weight to to look at where the need is in terms of throughout the city. Clearly, as you state, I think the last statistics I had seen, uh, the north side accounted for it, almost half of all traffic injuries, fatalities, pedestrian and, and, and vehicle. So clearly, they, I think they'd look at citywide where, where some of that need of enforcement is. Um, it, it may also shift depending upon their, their hours. I think they would look at times a day uh, and, and work with those precincts as well. Um, I would really, uh, rely upon DC Way to work with uh, those teams and, and see where they can do their best service in terms of the number of officers they have uh, throughout the city looking at traffic investigation statistics and times of day, busiest intersections where we're seeing issues and so, yeah. Great, thank you. So with all of that, one last question if I may, Madam Chair. Um, the I say all of this and also there is an underlying concern about a traffic enforcement division exasperating racial disparities in traffic stops and distrust between the community and police officers. And so taking that into consideration, um, we just heard that this is just the beginning, right? We The ideal staffing level is 10. So how are you or what do you need in order to be supported with um, deploying this uh, these resources and reestablishing this division in a way that does not exasperate these challenges. Because although the north side makes up 50% and we need more enforcement, if we deploy all three there, it's not a good look. <laughs> so, um, so I'm curious as to how how do we roll this new well reestablishing this division in a way that doesn't exasperate racial disparities. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Cunningham, I do appreciate that thoughtfulness in your, in your question. I will also say that uh, I've been working uh, with uh, our elected officials uh, specifically as it relates to our traffic data and our studies on racial disparities. Um, I know that we will have some results coming out next month that uh, we'll be sharing uh, and we'll be trying to build from that uh, because we don't want our, uh, our good intentions to lead to um, uh, negative consequences and outcomes for our community. And certainly uh, the, the, the conversation about racial disparities and traffic stops has been discussed here uh, in this chamber uh, as well as, uh, and I've been engaged with other communities as it relates to that. So uh, we want to continue to learn. We want to continue to make sure we're keeping all of our community members safe. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're not doing anything unintentionally uh, that exacerbates, as you mentioned, or causes more um, uh, friction or harm in terms of racial disparities. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to also point my colleagues to the Vision Zero discussion happening in Transportation Public Works next week as to how um, these departments work together on achieving Vision Zero. Uh, as an initiative. We have three more people in queue and then I know you still have two more change items and the fire department is outside ready to jump in. Um, please don't close out the slide deck because I think no. they're just next. So, um, <laughs> Council Member Schrader and then Bender and then Fletcher. Thank you Madam Chair. Uh, a lot of my 
questions were answered by Councilmember Cunningham. I, I also want to thank you for this. You know, my district straddles 35W. It's been an issue. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think one thing, and, and I appreciate Deputy Chief Joe's talking a little bit more depth about where the traffic unit has gone. Yeah. Uh, my constituents think if you add some more units, you'd be making bank down in Ward 11 and would be able to pay for more officers. Um, and in talking with uh, officers down there that were formerly on the traffic unit, they said that that had was initially the case and then over the years started to go away and one issue they brought up um, was just how um, the citations weren't followed up from the county i didn't know if there's any more um, i'm just trying to get kind of a handle on w whether the story is uh, the citations uh, to, for some of the other reasons created more of a barrier they, they were harder to do as we started to look at the the real effect and the real cost of policing in that way um, or if that is something we should be doing more about uh, following through Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Schrader, it's a great question. I know that we are currently having discussions regarding uh, e-citations and um, um, figuring that out. Matter of fact, um, uh, do, do you want to talk a little bit more about the citations? Thanks for the question, uh, Councilmember. Um, the, it is a complex issue and what was discovered when we thought that if you wrote different citations and, and uh, you know there's different rates of uh, uh, citations or for different uh, a seatbelt might be a $25 fine but then um, a loud party ticket could be as much as $700 I mean there's all these different rates and the assumption was that uh, uh, if you wrote a bunch of tickets that you would see an increase in revenue but what really happens is the court costs go up with the, the value of the ticket so it's a it's a basically the same scale. So as the, the price of a ticket goes up, we pay more to the county, and and it doesn't increase quite as much to the city as we thought it would. Uh, but still, that's uh, you know we feel that that's not the the philosophy we should be taking. It's a, a public safety uh, direction is where we should be going, and not looking at how do we. Uh, you know, generate funds to pay for more officers to do the same thing, and then kind of build. Um, but. Uh, so I mean, we're really asking to just fund officers uh, for the purpose of public safety. And uh, I do appreciate uh, Council Member Cunningham, you speaking to the different precincts, because I don't see Andrew Johnson in the room. But I guarantee you, if we add a, 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 a traffic officer, there better be one in the third precinct uh, doing some work, or he'll be on us, uh, because he talks quite frequently about traffic issues in his ward. and. Um, you know, this is this would be for the whole city. It's not for one uh, area. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's evident that our police department has exactly the right disposition, and it's different than how we've done traffic unit work in the past. And um, I just want to acknowledge that, um, Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief in the interest of time. I just want to voice some pretty significant concern with this proposal. Um, Along with the unresolved issues in our union contract, this is probably the piece of the proposed budget that I have the most concern and questions about. I don't think they're small details. Number one, we know from the experience in our city but across the country that it's very difficult to police your way out of traffic safety problems when your roads are designed for speeding. And we have great work happening in the Public Works Department on Vision Zero and our Transportation Action Plan. But you know, our four-lane arterials across the city are designed in a way that we know is unsafe. And so adding three traffic officers to enforce unsafe roads, I think we, there are a lot of questions about the effectiveness of that budget investment versus investing in safer streets. Um, I do think enforcement is an important part of Vision Zero, but we know, again, from the experience of other cities that it is, again, not a small detail that traffic enforcement also leads to higher um, racial profiling and that is that is the case, has been the case here and in, in other cities, and it often undermines the overall effort around Vision Zero to reduce and eliminate traffic deaths. So I'll follow up again in the interest of time, but I don't think these are small details. I think they are fundamental to the question of should we invest a half million dollars in three traffic officers if our goal is to reduce or eliminate traffic deaths. Thank you. I take that comment um, as the last one that we have in front of you for this one. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, the last uh, uh, change uh, request item for the Minneapolis PD for 2020 uh, is public safety cameras. Uh, this would be for ongoing funding to replace or repair 
our public safety cameras to ensure the best quality recordings are available for investigations. Um, funding in 2020 will be used to maintain uh, 15 cameras. Um, uh, 15 cameras. Uh, also, I should say that many of these cameras are monitored at our EOTF and at the precincts. Uh, there are oftentimes neighborhood requests for our cameras. Uh, some often donate or look for grant funding to provide for cameras in their neighborhoods to be used as a deterrent uh, or as an investigatory tool. Uh, so this funding will fix or replace those 15, and uh, this is an ongoing cost to keep the system up to date and working. Oh, I'm sorry, there's two more? Oh, one more. Okay. Question. Meanwhile, uh, Council Member Cunningham. Just real quick, for clarification, um, are these mobile cameras or permanently installed cameras? Madam Chair, uh, Council Member uh, Cunningham, these would be the permanent mm -hmm. fixed cameras, yes. Great, thank you. Oh. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, the, the last item here are in-squad mobile video recorders. Uh, the MPD MVRs are near the end of their life and no longer supported by the manufacturer. Uh, funding will support equipment replacements over five years at 40 cameras per year, and this is related to storage costs, which increases as those cameras are replaced. Um, a new MVR system will eventually allow MPD to maintain current service levels as current equipment becomes obsolete. Uh, the MPD will look at multiple types of systems, including cloud-based storage systems, and will fund the initial research, testing, and RFP process, uh, which I believe Director uh, McPherson mentioned earlier at $50,000. Um, a new MVR system will avoid the possibility of system failure with no replacements available. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate um, all of your efforts here. Thank you, Assistant Chief. Thank you, Deputy Chiefs and Ms. McPherson um, for all being here today and helping us to have a very thorough discussion of the MPD budget. Madam Chair, Committee Minister, thank you so much. Yep. Colleagues, oh, we are going oh, to switch. Oh, Madam Chair, ahead, I believe please. I have a follow-up. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, uh, for Council Member Cunningham, I had uh, a question regarding the Crimes Against Children Unit. And it is six investigators that are assigned, and, and uh, we have two social workers from Hennepin County child protection that are assigned to the unit as well. So I just Thank wanted to, to get him that those firm answers. Six plus, six plus two mm -hmm. uh, noted and we'll make sure he knows when he comes back. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right, then we are moving on to the fire department who is waiting in the wings here, ready to bust in the door. There he is, Chief Friedel, welcome. Um, I will note to my colleagues that we are running about 20 minutes behind. Um, but we might end up making up a bit of time in these next presentations. <laughs> Welcome, Chief. Oh, Welcome, thank you. Madam Chair, committee members, um, I'm John Friedel. Still proud to say that I'm Chief of Minneapolis Fire Department, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present the 2020 Mayor's uh, um, Budget to uh, the committee. Thank you. Um, You've also brought a lot of people with you, and if you want to just briefly introduce them, that'd be great. I would love to do that if I could. Um, I like to always, always say this, like you meet Minneapolis, because that's what we land on. It's what Minneapolis kind of looks like, but I always say that up front. But, my, to my left, or first to my right, I got my finance director, Luke Scardilli. And here to my left, uh, Ray Cruz, he's the um, assistant chief of operations. To his left, I have Amber Lays, who's the deputy chief of uh, emergency medical services. I got Melanie Rucker, who's the deputy chief of administration in our office. To her left, I have uh, Chief Klepp, John Klepp, who's the deputy chief of training. And I've got Tim Baynard, who is my engineering officer, deputy chief of engineering. And to our far left, I got my trusted HR generalist, Krista Guzman. Meet Minneapolis Fire. That's how I love to say that. Thank so. you. You're welcome. Um, a brief uh, a department overview. You can see in the org chart on the second page is the org chart um, of how we're pretty much structured. Um, by some of the folks that are here, they're on the top line of those boxes, and we kind of waterfall down underneath that. So there's a lot of people involved. Uh, today we're at uh, 420 firefighters, which is one firefighter over our authorized. We do expect a bunch of attrition the next few months, but we've been maintaining uh, right at the authorized level of our, our personnel. 
uh, who we are and what do we do. Um, you know, Minneapolis MFD has, you know, core value profession, which is uh, um, a very diverse collective personalities and shared values of, of its employees, integrity, compassion, service, honesty, and stewardship. These are values set, set the standard by which we perform our duties and achieve our goals to meet and exceed the, the expectations of, of, of those we serve. And that, that is very, very important to us. I'm proud of our firefighters that I have. I'm proud of the job that they do and the commitment dedication they continually demonstrate to the city of Minneapolis. Uh, current service level in uh, for 2019, uh, we still have the same programs that we've had over the last few budget cycles, um, fire suppression, uh, training and recruitment, um, and community risk reduction and community outreach. Uh, for the 2019 adopted budget, we had $69,331,000, um, and we had $10,000 that was um, in donations in 2019. Uh, for 2020, uh, the mayor's recommended budget has a modest increase of 2.5 percent, or a total of about 71 million uh, 43 uh, thousand dollars. Change items. We only have two change items. Uh, one of them is our protective gear, our protective equipment. Uh, that that ensemble includes fire coat, fire pants, hoods, gloves, boots. That's pretty much an entire ensemble, but. This particularly speaks to the coat and pants of our, our turnout gear, we call it, in the fire department. Um, it is uh, governed by a st national standard that states that after 10 years, we have to get rid of our turnout gear. Uh, so it, um, quite frankly, a lot of our gear probably won't last 10 years, depending on who's wearing it and how much. We have, in the past, have gone, um, we've had one-time funding annually or turnout gear, we are required to, we require that every firefighter has two sets. We are not quite there as of yet, but we're getting close. To make this ongoing, we have determined that it will take a, um, um, an ask for about $150,000 annually just to be able to maintain the purchase program we have to maintain the replacement program for two sets of turnout gear for all of our firefighters at this point. It, it's a challenging standard. Um, I would, you know, I'd like to see us have some, I, we just changed our our vendor for our, our turnout gear. I would like to see them consider maybe on some of our gear that would pass a, a 10 years test, still be able to be used in some for, fam, or, um, some way or, for, uh, or fashion. I'm not sure that's gonna happen, but as of right now, after 10 years, we have to get rid of all of our turnout gear and uh, including our helmets. So it, it's a challenging, uh, it's a challenging standard we have to meet. Um, our second ask is, um, $90,000 for two civilian FTEs. At the present time, we have a total of seven FTEs on the department. I only have, uh, at the present time, three FTEs in my administration in our offices. This would be for one position, be for uh, especially our health and safety coordinator. They will help uh, assist uh, Deputy Chief Rucker in processing all of our work comp issues and firefighter injuries and those types of things. I think we have to do a more of effective job of coordinating some of the care of our injured firefighters to do a better job. Let's get them out to the city physicians, get them their seeing their own physicians. Let's get them taken care of. Let's get the care they need, and let's get them back to work and try to minimize the impact of, of the longer lingering work comp costs that keep adding up and certainly stressing our department. And also the, the second position would be officer support, an off, I mean, an office support position. Uh, we had one that, that did retire, so that would be a replacement of that uh, one position. Um, I should say, to add one more position to our office support staff, uh, I would say the ask of that uh, was about $250,000, of which we repurposed about $125,000 out of our present budget to offset some of that cost. Any questions? That was pretty short and pretty sweet, I guess, considering. <laughs> I'm not seeing any questions. Um, Council, actually, a comment or a question from Council President Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. We really focus on change items in our budget presentations, which makes sense, but I wanted to ask about a previous investment that Council has made on the um, Career Pathways Program in the Fire Department, and here, the, like, in the context of the budget presentation, very briefly how it's going, and I guess I'm curious why, why there hasn't been an ask to expand it this year. Um, I'm proud to talk about our, our EMS Academy, especially that program. At the present time, we've, had, we've done, we've graduated three classes from our EMS Academy. Of those three classes, we now have 29 graduates of that program on our department. Uh, most of those classes have been over 70, 75% persons of color. 
uh, actually probably closer to probably 80. They've been very high. We are continually to work on a new response model and a different model, what that looks like. We're continuing to work with partners in that, and we are continuing to move forward with that, and I would be more than happy to have an offline discussion with anyone in regard to talk about that. We're going to continue the program. It is extremely, extremely successful. There are some challenges with that program with, with some of the, the young adults and the challenges that they have, but creating an opportunity we can make such a difference in their lives. And I know if you ask the 29 of them graduated on the fire department now, I know they would say that they really appreciate the opportunity that, that the city has given them and given us to expand that program to create opportunity for our young adults in the city who may not have, may have given up on and not have hope. And now if we give opportunity, it's amazing what we can probably do with that. So. Thank you. I mean, I just, I think I also just want to comment that I think this is a department, as you referenced, that as we look forward into the, um, you know, the, what we think the FTEs and the, the force will look like in the future, there's been a shift in the, in the needs in our community. And I think the department is responding to that. I, I know we all need, though, to work together to make sure that we're planful as we look out to the future and understand what kind of calls we're getting. I appreciate the department's full in, um, involvement in the 911 study that's happening at the direction of Councilmember Johnson and many other council members who are interested in that work. And then I just wanted to highlight the department's role in responding to the encampment and to folks who are living outside generally in our city, and that was absorbed in the department's um, budget existing budget but was really crucial a critical partnership that we saw of course last summer but i think is also an ongoing piece of work that the department is doing thank you thank you council member fletcher uh thank you chair palmasano I'll, I'll say the thing that i often say when uh when fire presents which is that when we don't have a lot of controversy about your proposal that means our constituents are experiencing uh a sense that if they called if they needed to that uh fire would be there and they feel confident in that so i uh, just appreciate all the good work and uh there's been some high profile things in my ward with uh worker rescue where a site collapsed and, and some things like that where fire's done just absolutely excellent work so i just want to uh thank everybody for their service and uh, for their consistency so that we're not hearing from constituents that they're concerned about response times and uh, you know we're, we're, we're hearing uh, great things about the department to the extent that we hear about you at all and sometimes uh, silence is the best compliment for uh, a work that everybody relies on. Thank you. Proud of them all. Uh, from a budget year-to-year -year perspective I do want to point out to my colleagues that the fire department did a really good job of bringing department contributions to the table when the mayor developed his budget he really asked that if if there were new asks in a department's budget that they bring forward their own money in part to see what they how they could be using money that exists within differently um, and that's an important ask so it I do want to note that the fire department did a really good job of doing that this year they're repurposing money for the turnout gear and repurposing funding for the civilian FTEs as well um, and as a reminder, you did receive five additional personnel last year. Is that correct? That's correct. So, um, Council Member Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Pomisano and Chief Beal. You know, um, I, I ran into a, a firefighter just this past Monday who um, is recovering from a heart attack and is expected to come back to work soon. And he was commenting on how. Um, helpful the department was in, in helping him to to overcome his illness and, and and welcoming him back to the force. So I was really pleased to hear about that. But I've also been hearing from um, some frontline staff about needle pickup, and I'm just wondering how the department is dealing with that. I know we've been challenged. Our community is, is really struggling with that issue but the department is as well and i'm curious how you're dealing with that hypodermic needles is what i'm referring to yeah that's your problem Council councilmember um, jenkins we are it is challenging and i'll be very honest with you we are we start picking up needles you know exclusively probably in in june we really got really involved with, with picking up the needles um today we are um we are over 12 to 1500 needles that we have picked up and they come anywhere from ones to 40 and 50 needles. Uh, we are gonna continue to pick them up because we need to pick them up. Somebody needs to pick them up. We will continue to do that. 
But with that said, we are also working with the health department to come up with um, a different plan that would take the pressure off our firefighters and the rigs to in picking up needles, and hopefully we'll have a, um, a much more effective plan um, in the next uh, few days where we can present back to the mayor in regard to um, the health department get, becoming more involved in addressing the issue of, of needle pickup. We have worked very closely with, with passing out information to the community in the proper disposal of needles and where they can go and how they can dispose of them. Um, and so hopefully we'll see, we're still gonna continue to respond to pick up needles, but I think if we make some appropriate assumptions, I think that through this, this plan we're gonna put together with the health department, I think we'll start to minimize the stress on us to go out and pick up needles through using other vendors and other sources that will assist in that program and with the community education piece that'll also be included in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, without any further questions from my colleagues, I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we're going to switch quickly to um, our city attorney to give her presentation on our city attorney's office mayoral proposed budget. Welcome, Ms. Siegel. Thank you. Thank you. Let me get the. Oh, thank you, Jessica. I've got my wonderful team here. Mary Ellen Hang, criminal deputy, Jessica Casper, the, who runs all of us extremely efficiently and innovatively, and Eric Nelson, uh, civil division deputy. So um, I will also try to be quick. We're, we're doing a lot, but we don't have a very complicated um, uh, set of budget requests here. Um, we're doing, I'd say we're doing a lot with, with what we've got and repurposing uh, FTEs and funds as we have them available. Um, so, yeah, next one. So we are divided into two divisions with two different budget sources. Just as a reminder, civil division is internal service fund and criminal division is our general fund. Um, in the civil division, you've got an extremely talented and skilled uh, law firm working on behalf of the people of the city of Minneapolis. And I point out a couple of recent examples of our work is that our, the minimum, city's minimum wage ordinance and sick and safe time ordinances we have successfully defended. What we didn't get from the district court, we succeeded uh, in, in getting from the Minnesota Court of Appeals in October 1. Uh, both cases are going to be before the Minnesota Supreme Court. Um, we've got very skilled real estate people working over in our CPED uh, department, and one example of that is the closing of the Nicollet Hotel block development, big development, and all of that work was done extremely competently in-house. Um, criminal division, uh, we handle over 15,000 cases per year and we have had a real focus on prevention and innovation to achieve uh, better outcomes, more effective outcomes, we would say, um, while implementing significant system reforms. And an example of that is our Pathways to New Beginnings program. Um, it's the community-based trauma-informed alternative programming in lieu of jail for persons charged with carrying a weapon without a permit. Um, we've now had 16 graduates uh, who've been doing really well with one exception, which is pretty uh, a great result. And we are arranging for expungements for the 16 graduates now that they're coming up on their two years. Um, and uh, except for this one exception, uh, the group hasn't even picked up a misdemeanor charge over two years. Um, there's national interest in the program. Uh, we're one of three programs selected by the Smart Decarceration Project at the University of Chicago for promising gun violence prevention programs. The Juvenile Court uh, has now worked with Urban Ventures, our partner in this, and it's being adopted for 16 to 17 year olds uh, through the juvenile court system. Um, and we just got an inquiry from the Gifford Foundation, Gabby Gifford's foundation. Um, they've heard about the program and, and they want to learn more. So you should all take pride in the amazing work that your city staff is doing day in um, and day out. 
Okay, enough of my bragging about how great my no, people in my terrific. office are. Nope, you're hearing lots of agreement up here. Yeah, yeah. So, so generally, I mean, we have not asked for changes in our current service level um, budget. We we have been repurposing positions um, as available in technology. Actually, in all these. Uh, uh, um, wizards we've got into our case management system actually have saved a lot of staff time and so we've been able to repurpose positions to positions that we we uh, uh, need as people have retired and as we can train people into these new um, into these new areas so we have only uh, two um, monetary requests for our 2020 budget and the first is to continue our work uh, around criminal justice system reform. And we're working both uh, on, on trying to move forward with statewide and legislative reforms. Um, I've been leading and a uh, forum will take place on October 18th that the Minneapolis Foundation is funding and Shonda Smith-Baker has put it together. Announcements on that will go out and that's looking towards broader change, but we've been focused also on what is within our power as prosecutors um, to reform now without, you know, before there's any kind of statewide more uh, broader system reform. And so uh, there's a program out in New York City that's in, uh, the Center for Court Innovation runs, it was initiated through funding through uh, the mayor's office in New York City, um, uh, that we want, I want to try a, an improved model of here, a different model that would fit better um, for us. So we have seen reductions uh, in the numbers of people with misdemeanors booked into the jail. There's been a 25% at least reduction overall um, since 2015, um, and well over 50% reduction uh, in that time frame for the less serious kind of the lower level livability uh, offenses being booked into the jail through the great work of Mary Ellen with uh, the adult detention initiative at the county. We've reduced that population further with things like the, the sign and release warrant idea for bench warrants to avoid people being arrested for those. Um, for the first time they've missed when we found out 70% of the people who got letters assigning their court date, in fact, never got those letters. So they, if police came across them, they were being arrested for missing a court date that a lot of people just didn't even know they had. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense, not a good use of resources. Um, so we've made progress, but one area where we could make further progress is there are some people who have a chronic failure to appear. And now the tools for dealing with that are fairly limited. It's hold them in, you know, set a bail amount um, that people can't afford to pay or would be an extra burden for people to pay um, and or impose uh, cash bail. And so this program in New York interested me because um, what it did was it provided extra support. So those people who currently are having bail imposed because of a fail higher risk score on their failure to appear for court um, will work with uh, social service agencies who can help then uh, set up reminders, set up a program for them to help get them to court. And this will work well with other things we already have in place, which includes um, a grant that Mary Ellen applied for um, uh, from the MacArthur Foundation that provides free rides to court um, and will work in sync with, with other things so that we can get people out of jail before their first appearance, increase their likelihood of appearing for court so that the cases can be uh, dealt with and resolved. Uh, and also it gives us the opportunity to connect people who need them and want them uh, earlier on with voluntary uh, social services. And uh, a restorative court is, the, is what the, the group wound up calling it, but they're really skilled social workers uh, who are working with individuals and it's the lower level livability types of offenses that drive 
um, uh, residents and neighborhood businesses, you know, it's uh, raised problems and issues, but yet they really have uh, underlying needs that that need to be um, uh, responded to and helped, or we're just going to keep having this revolving door. So we're we're asking for seventy five thousand dollars, and we think that's enough to at least get this up and running. Um, next is a continuation of our work on the the uh, um, outreach uh, program in domestic violence, where we, we for a number of years now um, have done follow-up visits in violent crime hotspots where there was a call uh, to 911 coded for domestic violence, but no police report or criminal case resulted. Well, we've collected a lot of data. We have a lot of information. Um, and what we've learned, and we also did listening sessions uh, uh, through the Cultural Wellness Center, and it seems the next iteration is really to help build up credible community-based resources uh, that families can access, will know about, and can access on their own, um, and also might provide an alternate to calling 911 and a police response when a police response is not needed. I'm going to warn you, this is a multi-year program, so for the $75,000 we've asked for here, um, and we're going to match that with $25,000 of out of our own budget, um, we are not going to have this done um, by December 2020, but we will make substantial progress and continue uh, down this path toward really improving um, the response uh, uh, in our neighborhoods to domestic violence and providing an alternative. Finally, um, we have gotten a renewal of a grant for this additional victim witness service employee uh, to do outreach, particularly um, uh, in our uh, immigrant communities with non-English speakers. Uh, and so all we're asking for is an unfunded FTE uh, for that. And with that, any questions? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Cunningham, probably not on this slide, but a couple previous. Yeah, if we could actually go back to the last slide, we're on domestic violence. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you to you and your team's leadership around helping to develop uh, domestic violence-based programming. I think that folks really just don't fully comprehend the impact of domestic violence. Um, the reality is is if we look at almost anybody who's involved with a gvi program for example um, through the office of violence prevention if we look back when, when their, their first interaction with the police department was under the age of five because of a domestic violence call and then again and then again and then when they reached their teens they started getting in trouble themselves and what we just see is a very clear connection between witnessing domestic violence in the home and that spilling out into the community and so um I, I feel like the city just really has a huge gap with addressing this huge problem, and I really am grateful that you and your office have stepped into that space to really begin to address this tremendous issue. Um, I, I think that, generally speaking, um, the work that you all are doing is really amazing, and also I think that we need a comprehensive domestic violence intervention system so that we are thinking about the whole cycle of domestic violence and how, what does it mean to be a perpetrator or a victim, a child with adverse childhood experiences and, um, and that's really like a city level, right? Right now you're carrying a lot of that and um, how do we help institutionalize that so that various departments also are doing that work and are putting resources into it and t uh, staff time. And so I'm grateful that you are bringing this to the table and that um, you are looking to expand the work. Um, and then my, my question that I have is, how are you collaborating with the Office of Violence Prevention um, around domestic violence intervention work? Chair Palmasano and Councilmember Cunningham, we're working very closely with them. Uh, there are a lot of demands on 
Sasha and Josh right now, but they have been great in joining us in this work. We're also uh, going to utilize, now that the Community Navigator Program is up and running in the Minneapolis Police Department, working with, and at our last meeting, the, the Domestic Violence Community Navigator um, was there, and, and uh, we will be using all the Community Navigators in this work as well. So really trying to maximize the resources the city already has in place, as well as working closely with you know, with, with the resources through the county um, and our community resources. Thank you. And I also just want to make the quick point that um, and point out that um, you and your team have a high success rate with domestic violence prosecutions as well when they do actually happen. And so I just want to also commend the level of work that you all put into that aspect of the work as well. So thank well, you. Thank you very much. On behalf of the domestic violence team, they are uh, tireless and skilled, and I just could not be more proud of them. So thank you so much. We have Council Members Bender, Schrader, and then Jenkins in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I would underscore all of the sentiments that Councilmember Cunningham just expressed and note that it was then Deputy Chief Arredondo that first shared with me that statistic about the um, prevalence of domestic violence among folks that we see as frequent offenders of, of criminal activity as adults. Um, and so I'm also excited to see this work continuing to grow and build and the collaborations to continue to deepen. Um, I don't want to, um, I could say more about all of these great proposals, but I, I want to flag one thing that is in a different topic, which is that in addition to all of this work, um, plus all the, all the other things the city attorney's office does, we rely on you and your staff to provide um, legal advice as well as drafting of city ordinances. And I think we are starting to see some some potentials for improvement in our system of, of proposing and creating new legislation. It's something that I've talked about with you, Ms. Siegel, and our city clerk's office. I just want to flag it for either this or future budgets as we think about what is our city's process for uh, proposing new legislative ideas, drafting them, is it, you know, does it make sense to rely on the very high level staff who are, you know, there to serve as policy advisors to also draft the legislation, or is there more efficiencies that we could find? Um, because just to be honest, I know there's a lot of frustration from council members and how long things take. There's a lot of um, concern from staff about workloads. And so I think in, in the interest of looking for efficiencies and ways to make sure that our, process, our legislative process is also transparent and understandable so that the community can also participate. Because I think sometimes when, when ordinances take years to even get a draft pr pr ready to put out to the public, um, it's often for many, many reasons, but that I think serves to frustrate our constituents because they feel like they don't know what's going on or stakeholders feel like we're keeping them some, something from them. So it's a flag for further conversation, but I think wanted to highlight that there's a lot more policy work happening, a lot more ordinance drafting, a lot more proposals coming, and I want to make sure that our whole city system is set up to do that well and to do that transparently and also honor all of the other work that staff is doing. Um, Madam Chair and Council President Bender, I think that is a good topic uh, for, because we work with other departments and we work with our elected officials in figuring out, uh, uh, getting us involved earlier in thoughts and helping develop that I think is really helpful, but, but it is certainly worthy of, of some real thought and consideration and thank you for raising that. Thank you. Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Don't have any questions on the programs, but I did want to talk about the workplace diversity. It, uh, from 2009, we were at 30 percent, and now in 2017, down to 21 uh, percent. And I kind of want to address if that's something you have plans to in increase the diversity in your workforce, or what kind of plans you'd have, or if that'll have any budget impact. Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member Schrader. I'm glad you raised that. That is something that is of the utmost importance to us. And uh, while it may not show in the numbers, and we have had um, people leave for a variety of reasons, not for dissatisfaction with our workplace, but to pursue other career options or at times to move or um, to retire even, um, uh, we, we have 
intentionally within the office promoted from within and promoted uh, people of color from within. Um, and so it's something we are working hard and very mindful of. Um, and uh, particularly in terms of attorney recruitment, um, looking at ways that we can improve our um, improve our diversity there. And, and that's, it's been a challenge. It really has been a challenge for us, particularly with attorneys, not, not so much elsewhere um, in the office, it, you know, in other jobs within the office. Um, and, uh, but it's something we're very mindful of that's very important to us. I've joined all the affinity bars and are trying to become more active in that, um, looking at different uh, maybe sources. I know Jessica Casper has suggested, uh, or Mary Ellen, one of you has suggested that the Public Defender's Office has had some success by going um, to, for example, Howard Law School out in Washington, D.C. in order to more effectively recruit uh, attorneys of color to our jobs. So I take it very seriously. Our whole office takes it very seriously, and um, it's important. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear about that. I, like, I will follow up just to continue. I'd also advise that uh, besides going to Howard, go across the street to my old law school, the historically black college of University of the District of Columbia. All right. There you go. Council Member two Jenkins. at once. Mm -hmm. Council Member Jenkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and I echo uh, Council Member Schrader's concerns. But I did want to just lift up the, um, the work that you guys are doing around cash bail and, and bail reform. Um, criminal justice reform is one of the, the biggest issues of our time, I think, in this in this country and, and certainly here in our city. And I think cash bail is really at the floor of that work and really uh, reforming that process and that system is is going to lead to some really significant and positive um, outcomes for our communities and our criminal justice system as a whole. So I'm, I'm happy to work with your office and with you personally on this issue, but um, really am grateful for the work that you guys are doing within your own department to, to make sure that even before we eliminate cash bail, on a broader level that we're um, addressing the concerns before people are put in those situations. So grateful for those efforts. Thank you. Thank, thank Madam Chair and Council Member Jenkins, I, Vice President Jenkins, I just want to thank you for um, working on bail reform was one of your priorities from well, well before you got elected to office. So I just really appreciate your partnership and your leadership on that issue. Looking forward to the um, forum that is going to happen in October, and hopefully my other colleagues will join as well. That would be great. Thank you. I know you have just a couple more slides here. Oh, and then... Uh, um, Micah Intermill cut our budget by $50,000 without telling us in advance, but we'll be fine. So is that, is that the last slide? I think so. Yes, that's it. Sorry. Sorry, Mr. Intermill. Thank you, Ms. Siegel. Um, All right. This completes, to my colleagues, this completes our department presentations for today, and I think this is a good start. I'll, I'll point out that the city attorney's office is bringing $25,000 of their own discretionary funds to both of the items that are receiving funding in the mayor's budget, and they're bringing in the grant funding for the additional FTE. So from a budget perspective, that's how the city attorney's office looks. Thank you all for your time today. Um, I will move to receive and file all three of these presentations at once. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Our business for today is done.